Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering fluid and electrolytes as well as acid-base imbalance. Now, I've done uh, videos individually. So I've done a fluid and electrolytes video and I've done an acid-base imbalance video, but this is the vid first video that I'm making that I'm combining the two together. And what I'm hoping is that it kind of all melts together and it makes more sense. So guys, if you haven't done so already, please be sure to like and subscribe below make sure you press that notification button so as soon as a new video is released you'll be notified and of course guys please support this channel by not only subscribing but also sharing my videos with anyone you know a current student recent graduate anyone that you feel would benefit from these videos please share 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 okay guys so without any further ado let's get started first question the nurse obtains all of the following assessment data about a patient with deficient fluid volume caused by a massive brain injury. Which of the following assessment data will be of greatest concern? One, blood pressure of 90 over 40. Two, urine output is 30 mLs over the last hour. Three, oral fluid intake is 100 mLs for the last eight hours. Four, there's prolonged skin tenting over the sternum. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. If you're new to my channel, just press the pause button. Whenever you're ready, you think you know what the right answer is, just press pause and we'll continue. So the correct answer is one, blood pressure is 90 over 40. So guys, um, let's go back to the question so it can make sense to you, all right? This patient's got fluid volume deficit. What does that mean? They don't have enough fluid. They don't have enough blood in the blood vessels. Well, I want you to think about that for a minute, okay? Because it has to make sense to you. If this patient does not have enough blood in the vessels, remember blood, that's what's carrying the oxygen, that's what's carrying the vitamins, that's what's carrying the nutrients to every single organ in your body. I'm talking about your brain, your eyeballs, your kidney, your spleen, your liver, every organ. So there's not enough of that to feed the organs. What can happen? Your organs can shut down. So when we're looking at what's going on with this patient, A, B, C, and D, A, which is the blood pressure of 90 over 40, that is our biggest concern. Why? With the blood pressure that low, the organs are not being perfused enough. What does that word perfusion mean? That means how much um, something's being fed, such as the organ, how much the organs are being fed, the oxygen, vitamins, nutrients that the blood carries. Um, those organs aren't going to be getting all of that good stuff with a blood pressure of 90 over 40. That patient's going to start to go through what? Shock and organ failure. So, you know, choices two, three, and four, yes, they need to be addressed, but our biggest problem is number one, the blood pressure. Why? If you haven't done so already, guys, make sure you watch my video on priority and delegation. Um, that one and the other video I made on how to pass the NCLEX, I cover the most important physiological integrity, what, what is most important um, when you're dealing with priority, right? And blood pressure is one of them. Whenever you get a question about priority, you have to say to yourself, what is going to keep the patient alive the longest and what's going to kill the patient the quickest? And guess what's on that list? Blood pressure. What else? So we have um, blood pressure, fluid and electrolytes, vital signs, the pulse, the respiration, glucose, um, nutrition. Make sure you guys catch that video because it will make so much more sense when you guys are doing these type of questions. So number one is the answer. Now let's talk about the wrong answers. Choice two, urine output of 30 mLs over the last hour. We want patients to have at least... 30 mLs every hour. So that patient only having 30 within the hour, it needs to be addressed, but it's still, it's in the normal range. Even though it's the low normal range, it's still the normal range. So even though we need to address that, that's not an emergency. It's not a priority. Two, oral fluid intake of 100, ml, 100 mLs, not over the last hour, over the last eight hours. So that needs to be addressed, right? The patient's not drinking enough fluid and we know they're hypovolemic. We know that they don't have enough fluid in their body, so we wanna encourage fluids, but that's not an emergency. We're not running to that patient. We're running to the 90 over 40 blood pressure patient. And then choice D, there's prolonged skin tenting over the sternum. What does that tell us? That tells us that the patient has fluid volume deficit, right? They need more fluids. So we need to address that, but our priority, 
is that blood pressure that is about to make that patient go into shock, okay? Next question, a recently admitted patient has a small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is causing syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. The nurse will monitor carefully for A, increase, increase total urinary output, B, elevation of serum hematocrit, C, decrease serum sodium level, or D, rapid and unexpected weight loss. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, and so the correct answer is C, decrease serum sodium level. So let me explain this to you. SIADH um, syndrome of um, inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, that is when the patient does not have enough diuretic hormone. So, diuretic. That's when the patient does not have enough anti-diuretic hormone. So what happens is um, that patient's holding on to all their fluid. They're not letting go of any of their fluid. They're not urinating at all, right? So guess what? That can cause the patient to go into fluid overload because they're not getting rid of their fluids. But here's what happens. And that's why C is the correct answer, decreased serum sodium level. So a patient with SIADH, they're holding on to all their fluids. They're at risk for fluid overload, right? All of that fluid dilutes the sodium in the blood, which can cause hyponatremia. When hyponatremia, you guys know the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia. We did that in the other food and electrolyte videos. Patients have neural issues, all type of issues, right? So we, we don't want that. What's the third thing we need to know about SIADH? Remember I told you patients holding on to all of their fluid, right? So the serum osmolarity is going to be down. Why? Because it's, it's um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's being uh, diluted by all the fluid, right? But the urine osmolality is high. So let me explain this to you. The patient's holding on to all their fluid. SIADH, that's what's happening. They're holding on to all their fluid. They're not urinating at all. They're not letting anything go, right? So the osmolality in the blood, those electrolytes in the blood are going to be diluted. So the serum osmolality is going to be down, okay? But the little bit of urine that the patient does let go of, the osmolality is going to be high, why? Because the little bit of urine that the patient's releasing, all that sodium and all those electrolytes that were in the blood, they come out in the urine. That's why the urine osmolality is going to be up, but the serum, the blood osmolality is going to be down. That is very important because guys, I've seen so many questions where they ask this, so you need to know this. So before I move on, I want to make sure you understand it. When it comes to SIADH, patients at risk for fluid overload because they're holding on to all of their urine. They're holding on to all their fluid. The serum, the blood osmolality is going to be low because it's being diluted. The urine osmolality is going to be high because all of the, the sodium, you got protein, everything's coming out what? In the urine. And what was my fourth point? I don't remember what my fourth point was, but I said already so you can rewind it and see what I said because I don't remember. So anyway, the correct answer is decreased serum sodium. So now let's talk about the other choices, the wrong choices, because you guys need to know why the wrong choices are wrong so that if you get a test question on a wrong choice, you'll recognize it. Look at A, increased urinary output. Patient with increased urinary output, that's the opposite of SIADH. You want to know what that is? Diabetes insipidus. Not diabetes mellitus, these are two different processes. Diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is the opposite of SIADH. In diabetes insipidus, the patient's releasing all the urine. They can't hold on to any fluid. That's why that patient's at risk for dehydration. So choice A, increased total urinary output. They're getting rid of all their urine. They're at risk for dehydration. That's diabetes insipidus. Choice two, an elevation of serum hematocrit dehydration, diabetes insipidus. Let me tell you, when you see the H and H up, that means dehydration, okay? So choice two, dehydration, and then you have choice D, a rapid and unexpected weight loss. 
That could be diabetes insipidus because the patient's getting rid of all their fluids. They're urinating all over the place so they can't hold any weight, right? So A, B, and choice D are all um, symptoms of dehydration of excessive water loss. But choice C, the decreased serum sodium, that is a symptom of SIADH because the patient's holding on to all their fluids and that sodium in the blood is being diluted. Next question. When the nurse is evaluating the fluid balance for a patient admitted for hypovolemia associated with multiple draining wounds, the most accurate assessment to include is A, skin turgor, B, daily weights, C, presence of edema, or D, hourly urine output. And the correct answer, guys, is B, daily weights. This is a famous test question, okay? So let me make this clear to you now. When you want to know... Um, the patient's um, fluid status, you want to assess the, their fluid status. The number one way to do that is not INO, it's not skin turgor, it's daily weights, guys. Choice B, daily weights, okay? You want that patient to take, um, you want to take that patient's weight every day, at the same time a day, preferably in the morning before they eat, using the same scale and the same type of clothing, okay? So the number one assessment for a patient's fluid status is going to be daily weights. I can't make that any clear, guys. You choose something else, you're gonna get that question wrong. When caring for an alert and oriented elderly patient with a history of dehydration, the home health nurse will teach the patient to increase fluid intake A, in the late evening hours, B, if the oral mucosa feels dry, C, when the patient feels thirsty, or D, as soon as changes in level of consciousness occur. And the correct answer, guys, is B, if the oral mucosa feels dry. Dry oral mucosa is what? A sign and symptom of dehydration. Let's look at our other choices, the wrong answer choices. A, in the late evening hours. You trying to make that patient have a fall? This is an elderly patient, right? So they drink in the late evening hours. In the middle of their sleep, they're going to wake up because they have to urinate. They're waking up in the middle of the night. They just woke up from sleep. So they're already going to be confused. Don't you get confused? Like as soon as you wake up, it's dark. They might fall and break a hip. So you don't want them drinking in the late evening hours. No. Choice C, when the patient feels thirsty. Remember what kind of patient we're talking about. The patients in the geriatric uh, population, they lose their sense of thirst. That's why you have to always remind them, Mr. Such and Such, make sure you take your sip of water because they lose their sense of thirst. That's why the um, patients in the elderly population tend to be dehydrated, okay? So don't tell them to drink when they're thirsty. They'll never drink. Choice D, as soon as changes in level of consciousness occur. First of all, you don't want to wait until the patient has a change in the level of consciousness for you to start to, um, for them to um, want to start drinking. Because guess what? If they have a change in the level of cog um, consciousness, you think they're going to have enough cognition to know, oh, I'm thirsty, let me take a drink of water? No, that makes no sense. So out of these choices, the best one is if the oral mucosa feels dry. Not if they're thirsty, if the oral mucosa feels dry. Why? That's a sign and symptom of dehydration. A patient's taking potassium-wasting diuretic for treatment of hypertension. The nurse will teach the patient to report symptoms of adverse effects, such as A, personality changes, B, frequent loose stools, C, facial muscle spasms, or D, generalized weakness. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is D, generalized weakness. Now, if you go back to the question, you'll see that the patient's taking what? 
potassium wasting diuretics such as la lasix where you la lose potassium right so the patient can become hypokalemic remember we want the potassium to be between 3.5 to 5 anything less than 3.5 the patient's hypokalemic and what does that cause muscle and um nerve um paralysis weakness flaccidity right what's one of the biggest muscles in the body the heart it can cause dysrhythmias right so the correct answer is d generalized weakness because that's a symptom of what hypokalemia and they told us in the question that the patient was taking a potassium wasting diuretic which makes us know that patient's losing potassium and a sign and symptom of hypokalemia is generalized weakness muscle and nerve paralysis flaccidity Okay, now let's look at our other answer choices. A, personality changes. We don't see that in um, uh, hypokalemia. Uh, we can see a change in uh, level of consciousness in a patient with hyponatremia when the sodium's low, right? We see these neural changes such as a change in level of consciousness, but we don't see personality changes in hypokalemia. Choice B, Frequent loose stools. That's something that we see in hyperkalemia when the potassium's too high, not too low. Choice three, facial muscle spasms. That's something we see in hypocalcemia when the calcium's too low, right? Remember, we see the trostec and the trousseaux, you know, muscle and nerve excitability, muscle and nerve irritability. Chostex starts with a C. That's the one where you touch your cheek and their face starts to twitch, right? And Trousseau starts with a T. That's the tetany. When you take the patient's blood pressure and their hand starts to go like this, the tetany. And you guys do have to know the difference between Chostex and tetany. And you have to know that both of those are signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. I've seen lots of test questions ask about those. So make sure you guys know your fluid and electrolytes. All right, next question. When caring for a patient admitted with hyponatremia, which actions will the nurse anticipate taking? A, restrict the patient's oil-free water intake. B, avoid using electrolyte-containing drinks. C, infuse a solution of 5% dextrose in 45% um, normal saline, half normal saline. Or D, administer vasopressin, ADH. And the correct answer, guys, is A, restrict the patient's oral free water intake. Remember what I told you? I think that was on the first question when I was talking to you about SIEDH and I was telling when a patient has too much fluid, what happens to the serum sodium? It goes down because it's getting diluted, right? Look at what's happening in this question. Patients got hyponatremia. Hypo means low. That NAT, natremia, nat NAT, we're talking NA, we're talking about sodium, and EMIA means in the blood. So low sodium in the blood. This patient's sodium's already low in the blood. You think we need to give them more water so it can be more diluted, so the sodium can go even lower? No. No. So what are we going to do? We're going to restrict their fluid because we don't want that sodium to go even lower. You guys know what happens when the sodium drops too low a patient has what neuro issues okay so we're going to restrict their free water intake now let's talk about the wrong choices b avoid the use of electrolyte containing drinks uh no the patient needs this they need those electrolytes especially what the sodium we're trying to bring that sodium up so b is wrong choice c infused solution of five percent dextrose and half normal saline Guess what? A hypotonic solution is going to make hyponatremia even worse. So that's wrong. And then we have choice D, administer vasopressin. You want to know what vasopressin is? Antidiuretic hormone. What does antidiuretic hormone do? It makes you hold on to all your fluid and not let it go. This patient's problem is hyponatremia. All of that fluid is causing the sodium to be diluted. So you think we want to give that patient something to make it even worse, to make them hold on to even more fluid, to make that sodium go down even more so the patient can have more neuro issues? No. 
So the only correct answer here is restricting that fluid intake. We're going to restrict the fluid intake while we give that patient a hyper tonic solution to bring up that sodium level. IV potassium chloride, 60 MEQ is prescribed for the treatment of a patient with severe hypokalemia. Which action should the nurse take? A, administer potassium chloride as a rapid IV bolus. B, infuse potassium chloride at a rate of 20 MEQs per hour. C, give potassium chloride only through a central venous line. Or D, add no more than 40 MEQs per liter to a liter of IV fluid. And the correct answer is B, infuse potassium chloride at a rate of 20 MEQ per hour. This patient's hypokalemic, we have to replace the potassium because you know what happens when a patient's hypokalemic, right? I, we just talked about this. That nerve and muscle what? Flaccidity, paralysis. We don't want that. Patient can have dysrhythmias, all types of issues. So we're going to replace the potassium and we're going to give, we can give it a rate of 20 MEQs per hour. By the way, 20 MEQs per hour, that's the max. That's the max that the patient can get, okay? You have to remember, yes, we need to replace the potassium, but potassium can be a lethal drug. Remember, um, well, you guys are watching me from everywhere, but I'm in the state of Florida, and here in Florida, that's how we kill the inmates that are on death row. They get what? Potassium to stop the patient's heart. So you cannot give too much potassium, and you can't give it too fast. You can kill the patient. So we can give 20 MEQ, and that's the max that can be given, but that's within the normal range. Let's talk about the wrong answer choices. You have A, administer potassium chloride as a rapid IV bolus. You would kill the patient. Okay, you would kill the patient. So no, we're not gonna do that. C, give potassium chloride only through a central venous line. That's not true. Um, and guys, be careful. Um, on my video on how to pass the NCLEX, I also cover different keywords. When you see to eliminate it, that's most probably not the answer and only is one of those. If you see an answer choice with only in there, don't choose it unless you know that you know that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that's the answer. But if you're like this and you're not sure and you're between that and something else, choose something else, okay? So I'm not saying when the word only is an answer choice, it's never the answer, but most often it's not. So anyway, um, C is incorrect because you can put it, you can give it through a peripheral line. We don't like to do that because potassium is irritating. It could cause inflammation, but if we have to, we will. So you, uh, um, you don't get potassium only through a central venous line. We prefer to, but you don't have to. So that's wrong. And then choice D, add no more than 40 MEQs to a liter of IV fluid. And that's incorrect. You can give actually up to 80 MEQs per one liter. Okay? So out of these um, answer choices, B is a correct answer by far. That's the only one that's right. You can give potassium chloride at a rate of 20 MEQs per hour. A patient who's, who has required prolonged mechanical ventilation has the following arterial blood gas results. The pH is 7.48, the PaO2 is 85, the PaCO2 is 32, and the bicarb is 25. The nurse interprets these results as a, metabolic acidosis, B, metabolic alkalosis, C, respiratory acidosis, or D, a respiratory alkalosis. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is D, respiratory alkalosis. So have you watched my other video I did on acid-base um, imbalance? You know, the very first thing you have to do when you're trying to figure out what the patient's going into is the pH. The pH is your key. The pH lets you know if a patient's going through acidosis or alkalosis. And the pH also lets you know if it's compensated or not compensated. Okay? So we are going to look at the pH in this question. And the pH is 7.48. And we know that the normal range for pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything less than 7.35, the, 
the patient is in an acidic state. Anything more than 7.45, and we know the patient is, is in an alkalinic state. And it's 7.48. So already, we know the patient's going through alkalosis. We don't know if it's respiratory, we don't know if it's metabolic, but we do know the patient's alkalosis, okay? After you look at the pH, <coughs> excuse me, and you figure out what the patient's going through, acidosis or alkalosis, the next thing you want to do is look to see what is out of range. If the CO2 is out of range, it's respiratory. If the bicarb is out of range, it's metabolic. So let's keep it moving. We go to the CO2 is 32. We know the normal range for CO2 is 35 to 45. If it's less than 35, patient's acidic. If it's more than 45, the patient is more what? Metabolic. And we look at this, then the patient is less than 35. It, it's acidic. This is out of range. The patient's going through respiratory alkalosis, right? Now, just for sugars and giggles let's keep going let's look at the bicarb and the bicarb is in normal range 25 the normal bicarb is 22 to 26 some books say 27 but that range right so 25 is perfectly fine the only two that are out of range is the co2 so we know it's respiratory and our ph that lets us know that the patient's going through alkalosis and the correct answer is d respiratory alkalosis so guys that's how you figure out what the patient's going through look at the ph and then you look at your CO2 and your bicarb and see which one's out of range. And that will let you know if the patient's going through alkalosis or acidosis. Now, very quickly, if you want to know if it's um, compensated, the pH tells you if it's compensated. If the pH is within range, 7.35 to 7.45, it's fully compensated. Fully. But if the pH is out of range but your bicarb and your respiratory, the, um, the, they're also out of range. That shows that they're trying. They're trying to get the pH back to normal and that makes it partial, partial compensation. It's gonna make more sense, guys. I promised you a video where I actually have a whiteboard and it's gonna be visual for you. I ordered my whiteboard, I'm just waiting for it to come in, but it'll make more sense once I have that video up and you have the visual. So just wait for that, it's coming, I promise. And I cannot believe I'm already down to my last question. Um, guys, I promise this will also be a part two because there's so much more I wanna cover. So much good stuff, okay? So this is the last one, but there will be a part two. Make sure you look out for it. The nurse notes that a patient who was admitted with diabetic ketoacidosis has a rapid deep respirations. Which action should the nurse take? A, notify the patient's healthcare provider. B, give the prescribed as needed lorazepam. C, start the prescribed as needed oxygen at two to four liters per minute. Or D, encourage the patient to take deep, slow breaths. And I'll give you a moment. The correct answer is A. You're going to have to call the doctor. Okay, and you know, I talk to you guys a lot about this before you choose an answer of call the doctor, always look at your other choices and say to yourself, can I do any of these for my patient to help my patient before I turn my back to call the doctor, okay? But when you look at all your other choices, you can't do any of those for your patient. So you have no choice. You need to call the doctor. So what is going on here? The patient's going through diabetic keto acidosis so what's happening metabolic acidosis it can't be respiratory patients going through diabetic ketoacidosis so clients having metabolic acidosis right this is what's happening when you see diabetic ketoacidosis i want you think in your mind metabolic acidosis okay follow me so now we know patients going through metabolic acidosis because we see ketoacidosis. Now, as we keep reading, we see the patient has rapid, deep respirations. That's what's known as Kussmaul's respirations. Let me explain to you what's happening. The body's trying to compensate. So the kidneys are in trouble because the patient's going through metabolic um, acidosis, right? Here's how the lungs try to compensate. Remember, the lungs are responsible for CO2. CO2 is what? Within itself. Acidic. 
carbon dioxide, or to help you remember, you can call it carbon diacid. So you can remember that carbon dioxide is acidic, right? So here we have this patient that's going through metabolic alkalosis and the kidneys are screaming, help, help, help. And the only organ that can help those kidneys when the kidneys are going through metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, are the lungs. And the lungs can only do one of two things. The lungs can increase the rate of respiration or slow down the rate of respiration. So when you see the patients having these rapid, deep respirations, which are known as cool smalls respirations, they're going like this. <laughs> Here's what's really happening. The patient that's going through diabetic acidosis, guys, I can't speak. The patient that's going through metabolic acidosis and screaming for help, and you see the lungs, the, the patient's breathing out, breathing off that CO2. They're getting rid of the CO2, which is acidic, to try to throw the patient into a more balanced state, more alkalinic. Does that make sense? So this patient is in an acidic state and the lungs start blowing off all the CO2, which is acidic. It's trying to get rid of the acid to help the body be more balanced. This is what we're seeing here, guys. So why do we have to call the doctor? Because we need an order to give the patient something like sodium bicarb, something that's alkalinic because the patient needs to go towards a more alkalinic state because right now they're in an acidic state. Okay. They're not balanced. Let's look at our other choices. Choice B, give them Ativan. You want to know what Ativan is going to do? Ativan's going to relax them and guess what? Their breathing is going to slow down. What happens when your breathing slows down? You blow off less CO2 and you're keeping it in your body, which makes you what? More acidic. Do you want to do that? No, the patient's already going through metabolic acidosis. We're trying to make them less acidic, not more acidic. Choice three, give them the prescribed oxygen. Guess what? Giving them oxygen isn't going to slow down that acidity. Choice four, encourage the patient to take deep, slow breaths. Guess what? Taking that deep, slow breath is going to do what? Make them hold on to the CO2 instead of blow it off. We're trying to get rid of CO2, not hold on to it. So your only thing you can do in this scenario is call the doctor because we need to give that patient something that's alkalinic, something that's a basic to throw them into a more balanced state. Okay, guys, I have lots more questions to go over with you, so please watch out for part two of this video, which will be coming soon. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe below. Press that notification button. And of course, if you appreciate the content that I'm bringing you, please support me by sharing my videos. Thank you so much, guys, and I'll see you next time.